Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is a very special occasion. Uh, we are discussing and welcoming a new book by Kevin O'Sullivan. I'll introduce him a little bit in a moment. Uh, just to say, first of all, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute uh, at NUI Galway. And I work uh, with Kevin, who's an associate director of the Moore Institute. He has many qualifications, including the fact that he's a lecturer in history in the School of History and Philosophy at NUI Galway. And he has produced this wonderful book, new book, The NGO Moment, which we're going to discuss today. And we have a, a series of distinguished speakers who are going to comment on it. Um, the NGO Moment, The Globalization of Compassion from Biafra to Live Aid, which has been published by Cambridge University Press. Um, we have four speakers who are going to give us our, their thoughts on various different aspects of this book and the challenging questions that it raises. So I'll just give you introductions to them now, and then we'll turn to them for comments for about five to eight minutes each, um, and then we'll have some reflections and responses by Kevin himself. So our first speaker is Michael Neumann, and he is Director of Studies at the Centre de Réflexion sur l'Action et les Savoirs Humanitaires, Médecins Sans Frontières. He is Director of Studies at CRASH, Médecins Sans Frontières, and he is a graduate in, uh, in Contemporary History and International Relations from the University of Paris. And he joined Médecins Sans Frontières in 1999 and has worked both on the ground in the Balkans, Sudan, Caucasus, um, West Africa, and in the headquarters in New York and Paris as deputy director responsible for programs. He's also carried out research on issues in immigration and geopolitics. He is co-editor of Humanitarian Negotiations Revealed, the MSF Experience, and also co-editor of Saving Lives and Staying Alive, Humanitarian Security, in the age of risk management. Professor Silvia Salvatici um, is going to be our, our second speaker and she's a professor of contemporary history at the University of Florence and a principal investigator on the ERC funded project, Humanitarianism and Mediterranean Europe, a transnational and comparative history 1945 to 1990. She's previously been professor of modern history at the University of Milan, an honorary research fellow at the School of History, Classics and Archeology span in Birkbeck. Associate Research Fellow at the Italian Academy of Columbia University, and the Fernand Baudel uh, Senior Fellow at the European University Institute. And in 2011, she was Susan Currier Visiting Professor for Teaching Excellence in Gender and Humanitarianism in California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. Her recent uh, research interests focus on refugees in the contemporary age and uh, the history of humanitarianism including a history of humanitarianism, 1755 to 1989, in the name of others, published by Manchester in 2019. Well, then uh, next be turning to Professor Andrew Thompson. He's professor of global and imperial history and a professorial fellow at Nuffield College and the University of Oxford. Um, he is indeed co-chair of the Global and Imperial History Center, also in Oxford. His research interests are suitably expansive. They include uh, global histories of humanitarianism, of human rights and development, the history of modern globalization and the relationship between globalization and empire, the effects of empire on British private and public life during the 19th and 20th century, history of migrations and mobility, and the history of colonial and apartheid South Africa. He's also written on Anglo-Argentine relations, transnational migration and migrant remittances and public memories and legacies of empire. Andrew is currently researching international human, uh, humanitarianism and human rights and the emergence of the modern aid and development sector. And it forms the subject of a forthcoming work, Humanitarianism on Trial, how a global system of aid and development emerged through the end of empire, which will appear with Oxford University Press. He's held various previous appointments of note uh, at the University of Exeter as professor of, of imperial and global history, he was also Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of Leeds, where he also held a professorship in history. And he will also be known to many people, and these where I first met Andrew in his capacity as uh, Executive Chair of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the AHRC in the UK, where he was an extraordinarily effective advocate for research at all levels, um, and uh, a very welcome participant in public conversation in that domain, amongst others. And then we will turn to Dr. Sinead Walsh, and she's the climate director of Irish Aid in the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> she uh, was climate director and deputy 
Gen uh, Director General of Irish Aid before that at Africa at Ireland's uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. She's previously served as EU Ambassador to South Sudan between 2018 and 2020, as Irish Ambassador to Sierra, Sierra Leone and Liberia 2014 to 2016, and as a Development Specialist within Irish Aid. Before joining the diplomatic service, Sinead spent 10 years in the NGO sector, predominantly with concern. She was awarded a PhD in social policy, uh, writing on accountability and in international development from the London School of Economics and Political Science in 2014. She is a graduate of Harvard University and UCD. And she's also been a visiting senior fellow at uh, the Humanitarian Initiative and, and a visiting scholar at Harvard University's Medical School. And while at Harvard, she completed with Oliver Jackson the book, Getting to Zero, a doctor and a diplomat on the Ebola Frontline 2018, based on her experience of the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone. So we really are blessed with a wonderful set of respondents and participants. So I'm now going to turn to our first speaker, Mikael, if you could uh, you turn your camera on. Thank you very much. Very much looking forward to your remarks. Over to you. Uh, Mikhail, you're muted there, if you can. Of course, I'm muted. There we go. Um, yeah, well, thank you, uh, Dan, for your introduction and Kevin for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad to be part of that event. It was also a pleasure to read the book. Um, so, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm glad for the opportunity to, to discuss it with you and ask a few questions to Kevin, actually, so that he also gets a chance to present his book to, to us and, and, and to all of the audience. Uh, actually, in fact, what's refreshing about Kevin's book uh, in the eyes of a French self-centered parochial humanitarian is, is that there is hardly any mention of MSF in it, uh, including, of the, uh, including in the Ethiopia chapter. It's quite a miracle, really. Um, you know, it's like uh, George Perec uh, writing his famous entire book about, uh, you know, without using the letter E. Um, you know, it's, it's quite, uh, in a way, exotic uh, for me as a reading, and, and I really appreciated it. Uh, but it's also interesting in many other aspects. Um, and, and I will get back to some of us uh, in, in this uh, in these minutes. Uh, a general comment uh, for the future reader. Uh, it's a book that, like a thread, uh, really, it's, it builds up uh, its meaning uh, as it goes along, uh, or rather multi-thread, in fact, as we follow the evolution of a, of a sample of Western Anglo-Saxon NGOs through the twist of the world uh, history between the late 60s and the mid 1980s. So as one chapter helps build uh, and give a meaning to the one after that, I think it is worth reading the whole book. Um, it, it's not a book that you read chapter in isolation to one another, but I think it really uh, gets a full meaning when you, when, you, when, you, when you have read it all and not just portions of it. Uh, it does very nicely portray a global trajectory uh, yet it also leaves space for the uh, heterogeneity of views and the diversity of actors. And as much as Save the Children, MSF, World uh, Vision, or to mention the NGOs you study, given a uh, war and want, a uh, childcare concern, share different views, uh, their trajectories are designed by evolution that are common to all. And I think this is in this like mix of uh particularities and commonalities that this book is particularly uh, interesting uh to go more into some of the details uh, now and adding to them a few questions for 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 kevin uh i like first to uh point out the notion the idea of a system uh, that's quite present in the second part of the book uh that system whose roots, humanitarian system, I mean, of course, whose roots are somewhat older than I thought. Uh, in fact, in, this, the, 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 in, in, in the sector, we are keen to see uh, the mid 1980s as 90s, 1990s as being the, the, the uh, era in which the, the, the system emerged. Uh, but you show the, here the premises of it, and, and I find it particularly uh, enlightening. 
uh, the illustration of that ecosystem in the making and the building of communities of practice, uh, aka Edland, is very, very compelling in, in, in the book. Uh, but drawing from that observation, I have a first question. Um, a bit like risking a replicate of a perhaps caricatural opposition between internationalism and functionalism. How much, Kevin, do you see this system to be a product of a political project or rather an object which has developed slightly organically? Uh, so that's the first question for you. Beyond that one, another interrogation I have in relation to what I believe you're right. Uh, NGOs in this book are very much aware of politics. I mean, what appears here is a very extremely political arena. This is true all along, uh, from the late 60s to the mid uh, 1980s, which all makes the claims of humanitarian, humanitarian apolitism quite ludicrous. Uh, yet I'm wondering how aware NGOs and their leaders uh, have been of how and how much they, have, uh, they are instrumentalized by states and international politics. Uh, are they the puppet of political projects? Uh, to what extent are they aware of those projects? And I was wondering what have been the reflections amongst those groups uh, in the 70s and 80s about their autonomy of choices, about them being part, willingly or uh, unwillingly, of a political project. Um, so uh, 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 another comment in form of question. Uh, amongst your case studies, there are Cambodia, Salvador, Ethiopia. For MSF, these are three paradigmatic episodes of diversion of it either to feed propaganda or at the benefit of criminal enterprises. Yet those aspects are relatively discreet in your book. And I was wondering if it was because that would be a very French centric point of view or because in fact, you believe yourself that the real issues are elsewhere. And um, well, perhaps actually a last one. <laughs> Another question um, on a slightly different topic. In chapter four, which deals with uh, which uh, titles is NGO and advocacy, you tell about the companionship of NGOs with the eradication of poverty movement. Would you say that we saw in later years a symmetric one, conscious or not, by which NGOs espoused IMF, World Bank, neoliberal politics? and largely participated in the dissolution of the state services in the global south, in particular in the field of health and education. And if so, why does it not appear more clearly in your research? So uh, yeah, that's it for me now. I mean, uh, pretty much uh, more questions than comments, but I found more interesting actually to try to enrich the discussion by having you reflect on those different aspects. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin, again for the book. I think it's, uh, it, it does make a, a great contribution to the history of humanitarianism. And, and again, as a practitioner and, a, and, and, and somewhat a, a researcher, I, I certainly will encourage uh, colleagues in, 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 at MSF and elsewhere to, to have a look. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mikhail, and um, we we'll look forward to Kevin's responses to those challenging questions. You've got us off to a very good start. So we're going to turn now to Sylvia. So uh, Sylvia, you, uh, over to you now. You're you're muted. So okay. okay. There you go. There you Sorry go. about that. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot. Thanks to Dan for the nice introduction, to Kevin for the invitation. And uh, I really also enjoyed to, uh, reading this book. And I have to be honest, uh, um, I have been looking forward to the publication of this book, um, given the promising articles and, and book chapters that Kevin has produced in recent years. And all the contribution, these contributions anticipated 
some of the issues that Kevin has fully developed in the NGO moment. For example, the period between the 60s and the 80s is crucial for the history of humanitarian NGOs. Uh, the multi-scale analysis of NGO action, which connects local, national, and global dynamics, uh, and the multifaceted nature of humanitarianism, which in the books is seen through its political, social, and cultural implications. So as we all know, the history of humanitarianism has greatly expanded in the last uh, 15 years. And it has covered a wide range of topics. In spite of that, I believe that Kevin's book closes a gap in the literature, which has devoted a good deal of attention to NGOs, but has rarely put them at center stage. Uh, as Michael said already, the NGO moment is a very well-researched book, very rich of information and very challenging for the arguments it offers. Uh, however, given the little time we have at this position, I, I'm going to focus mainly on the first part of the book, although as Michael said, it's worth reading all the book together. Uh, and the, the chapters, uh, uh, the first chapters are devoted to the entanglements between humanitarianism and the definition and redefinition of the post-colonial order. Uh, I admit that the choice uh, um, to focus on this chapter is, is due also to the relevance of the topic to my own research projects. So I'm very grateful to Kevin for these very inspiring opening chapters. So uh, according to Kevin, the Biafra War was the key event for the NGO encounter uh, with the Third World. Um, I, actually, this statement is not entirely surprising. Uh, um, the war between the federal government of Nigeria and the secessionist state of Biafra has been the subject of many studies over recent years. Uh, most of the literature has mainly investigated the unprecedented scale of uh, mobilization of the mobilization campaign and the bulky role of the media in promoting it. Kevin, of course, this on existing literature, but he moves forward exactly because he doesn't look only at the years between 1967 and 1970, but also at the long-term effects of humanitarian actions taken in the time of war. For example, he goes well beyond the, the acknowledgement that NGOs were the driving forces behind the vast Biafra campaign. He brings to the fore the rapidly increased support, support of Western people to NGOs, which during the war appeared much more efficient than governments and international organizations at managing humanitarian aid. As Kevin clearly argues, in gaining people's baking, NGOs were able to play a, a decisive card, access to those in need. Citizens of Western countries did not have a clear idea of what accessibility meant, referring to an African country devastated by the civil war, but it was easy to them praising the voluntary agency's dynamism in front of the intergovernmental agency's cautious reaction and in front of the paralysis due to the difficult negotiations with the Nigerian authorities. Undoubtedly, as Kevin demonstrates, NGOs were the most successful humanitarian bodies in distributing aid among the Afrin population, thanks to the special relationship they had with the Christian missionaries already in the area. The dense web of connections that bound the British, Canadian, and Irish missionaries aid workers and ex-colonial officials to Biafra was essential in opening the region to international aid. Uh, 
I think this is a very important point. Uh, the relevance of the missionary work for the development of humanitarianism has been widely acknowledged, but many authors have limited it to the colonial time in a sort of prehistory of modern humanitarianism, the time when evangelism and belief were intertwined. The NGO moment shows us missionary work lasted well into the post-colonial time. As Kevin argues, the transition from the colonial to the post-colonial time, um, I'm quoting from the book, marked less a change in attitude than a, a variation in tone. The mechanism of paternalism remained more or less intact. Uh, end of quote. In Biafra, this meant reducing the complexity of crisis to simple, easily consumable messages. In turn, consumable messages fostered a simplified image of the third world, bound up with catastrophe, entrenched, entrenched poverty, and dependence on aid from uh, so called advanced nations. It was ultimately this pervading image which was to remain the cornerstone of international humanitarianism for decades to come. So the special relationship between NGO and the people of the West, confirmed by the exceptional fundraising results achieved, went hand in hand with the reformulation of the narrative around humanitarianism. Uh, NGOs presented themselves to Western citizens as the tools by which they could individually show their own solidarity with other peoples. So this is what Kevin calls the people-to-people -people narrative that was central to the humanitarian work of the NGOs that in taking on the task of keeping interest in the unfolding tragedy high, effectively became translators of Biafra for the watching public in the West. And I'm quoting Kevin again, but in a previous paper, from a previous paper published by the Humanitarian Policy Group of the Overseas Development Institute. I believe this is another important point, a, an important conclusion, I would say, also from the historiographical point of view. The NGO moment shows how far humanitarian history has come since its beginning, its progression from a highly institutional approach focusing on governments and international organizations to, to the new attention of the grassroots mobilization. Of course, state and non-state actors are not seen as separated bodies. On the contrary, Kevin demonstrates that the Biafra War accelerated their interaction and cooperation, and in turn, interaction and cooperation created new although not always visible, dependencies between humanitarian NGOs and the states. But my time is over and I would like uh, uh, Kevin to expand a bit on this point when uh, uh, he will have the floor and will react to our um, uh, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. And yes, we'll, we'll hold Kevin to that and, uh, and get back to him in due course. So uh, I'm going to now turn to, to Andrew Thompson. And uh, Andrew, looking forward to your, your comments and thoughts. Thanks very much, Dan, and good to see you again, uh, if only online. Um, let me add my congratulations um, to the first two speakers. This is uh, an important piece of work that I found myself um, nodding much more um, in agreement than disagreement with. And I think we, we've seen a proliferation of new scholarship on the 20th century history of NGOs in recent years and looking at the relations of NGOs to humanitarianism and human rights and development. Um, but this book does stand out for, for several reasons. 
One, I think, as already uh, mentioned, is its distinctive periodization. Uh, three decisive decades, which cover an era from uh, the 1960s and the UN's first decade of development and closing in the 1980s and 90s with what I would call the, the second wave of NGO expansion. I think it's also important for the way that it works across national traditions and approaches to and cultures of aid. It's especially strong on smaller as well as larger Western states and uh, NGOs. So we hear about Ireland and the Nordics and Canada as much as we hear about the US and the UK and France, and I think that's very welcome. And it weaves together ideologies as well as institutions. And I think in doing so, it helpfully reminds us that ideas as much as interests have helped to shape that global politics of compassion that emerged from the, the Second World War. And Kevin also rightly, I think, is at pains not only to take the mindsets and the makeup of individual NGOs seriously, so we get very good pen portraits of Concern and Oxfam and Save and War on Want, etc. But he also keeps bringing the reader back to the wider environments in which the histories of these individual NGOs were forged. So we hear about globalization, the rise of transnational civil society, modernization linked to high development theory, decolonization, neo-colonialism and the Cold War. Perhaps a little bit more might have been said about trajectories out of and the legacies of the Second World War, especially for the militarization of aid. What I want to focus on in, in the rest of my marks is the way in which this book seeks to anchor the NGO moment in two of the major and most consequential post-war international relief campaigns. And particularly because I think it's refreshing to see Bangladesh, which is often overlooked, paired with Biafra, upon which one might say much ink has been spilt. But Sylvia's right is it's Biafra is unavoidable and, and not least because as Kevin shows, it involves so many relief agencies, the faith-based and secular, large and small, uh, mostly with the exception of UNICEF from outside the UN system, not inside. It's also important because it is the first televised famine as Kevin says. And I think because of that, it raises questions that we might ask um, Kevin to reflect on about how what you might call the script for international media coverage of humanitarian crises would emerge from this period. That frequent refrain that then echoes down the decades of arriving too late, of being too slow to get off the mark, of the sort of chaotic picture of multiple aid agencies clamoring for attention and funding. It's all there in coverage of the Biafra and Bangladesh. You might say that the horror story of human suffering gets paired with the horror story of botched disaster relief operations as the stories that journalists go looking for. And so by the 1970s, as Kevin shows, uh, it's clear to NGOs that their future involvement in humanitarian emergencies is going to be as much a matter of complex PR exercises as it is of logistical challenges and political minefields. I'm not entirely sure if Biafra was the first real test of the West's response to the crises in post-colonial Africa. Uh, I would have thought that was probably the Congo where a disastrous UN peacekeeping operation has an international relief operation grafted onto it. And I think the experience of that peacekeeping operation in the Congo explains why the UN is actually largely absent in Biafra. But Kevin is absolutely right that Biafra is transformative for humanitarians. Um, it was, I think, uh, uh, and Kevin usefully un unpicks this, uh, a humanitarian intervention, even if a lot of historians have been hesitant to call it that. What was for NGOs a humanitarian airlift was for the Nigerian government a thousand unauthorized arms laden flights. And I think in that sense, the, the book is helpful in the way that it shows how Biafra and the experience of Biafra 
bolstered an assumption in the NGO community that they could and should intervene in such circumstances and the way in which that feeds into paternalistic vis uh, visions of aid. Perhaps a bit more might have been said in the Biafra context on why and with what consequences the ICRC operation was effectively hijacked by a former Swiss diplomat and former High Commissioner for Refugees, August Lint. This was politics red in tooth and claw. And I think it shows how the entanglement of state and non-state interests in Biafra ran alongside the moral and religious impulses that provided such sympathy for the Biafran cause. But as I said, the book is um, interesting and important because it, it pairs um, alongside Biafra, something that doesn't get as much coverage in the historiography. And that's the Bangladesh cyclone and civil war in, in, from 1970 to 1972 where aid was again an act of solidarity as well as an ex, uh, assertion of technological proficiency. And where again, aid workers from many different countries and backgrounds would meet and mix. And where again, the UN declined to intervene. This time the exception was UNHCR um, and not UNICEF. But India, of course, was determined that this crisis was going to the, well, the refugee crisis produced by the civil war was going to be internationalized. And I think even more than in the case of Biafra, as far as NGOs are concerned, what Bangladesh did was to blur the lines between organized relief and acting as witnesses to atrocities. And the, the book is also, I think, very interesting in the way it explains how Bangladesh acted as a powerful pivot between humanitarianism as emergency relief and the realm of longer term development aid. Although there, I think more attention might have been given to BRAC as a powerful form of non-Western humanitarianism and to its predecessor help. Still seems to me that BRAC uh, as you will, uh, I'm sure everyone will know, one of the world's largest aid agencies today is still very much neglected in the historiography. Interestingly, BRAC, as it emerged from the Bangladesh Civil War, did not present itself as an anti-colonial or even a post-colonial NGO, but rather as an organization that was committed to achieving social justice and social change within Bangladesh itself. And in that sense, I think the, the Bangladesh International Relief Operation and the emergence of BRAC serve as a signifier of the way in which the Bangladesh Civil War closed a narrative of the post-colonial state that had opened up with the independence of India and Pakistan in order to inaugurate a different kind of narrative, which was a narrative of a new kind of nation liberating itself from a minority Punjabi rule and appealing for intervention from an international community against human rights abuses in the name of humanitarianism. And finally, I think that the story of BRAC also feeds into another strand of Kevin's book. And that's this question of what development NGO style would look like from the 1960s and 70s onwards at a time of expanding conception of human needs. And what's interesting, I think, about the international relief operation in Bangladesh during the cyclone and civil war is that it occurs at a transitional NGO moment. It's transitional as refugee relief morphs into rehabilitation and then to development. Transitional in the sense of multilateral institutions as well as NGOs coming to place a heightened emphasis on rural development as an engine of growth, and transitional in the way that some NGOs begin pushing much more strongly for bottom-up and grassroots and community-based forms of development. And last but not least, I think it's traditional uh, transitional because in the 1970s, we begin to see a growing minority of NGOs 
looking beyond women's lives simply through the prism or looking at women's lives, not just simply through a prism of food security and population growth and fertility, but to begin to recognize the vital role that women might play as agents of rural development themselves. So lots to go at in this book and uh, Kevin, look forward to hearing some of your responses. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah, it gives us a lot to look forward to in your own uh, work in this domain that's uh, that's uh, that's forthcoming. So and uh, look forward to Kevin's response too. So we're now gonna turn to Sinead. Uh, Sinead, over to you. Thanks, Dan. And um, yeah, it's really it's really great to be here. Uh, Kevin took a bit of a chance because we've never actually met, but I, I loved his first book, Ireland, Africa and the End of Empire. Uh, and, and luckily, Kevin, I, I'm equally a, a big fan uh, of this book. Um, maybe first to say uh, I'm, I'm speaking in a personal capacity today. I, I currently head up, uh, as Dan said, the climate team in foreign affairs, so I'm no longer on the front line of NGO funding where, where I've been in the past. Um, but, but I have uh, spent most of the last 20 plus uh, years uh, since college working uh, on NGOs, in NGOs, uh, researching NGOs uh, or, or funding them. Uh, so uh, this, this book is, um, uh, yeah, very, very, uh, re very resonant and very meaningful uh, to me. Um, and I think I would also, kind of, you know, use stress, maybe the phrase personal capacity in a slightly deeper way uh, in that uh, I very much, you know, recognized myself uh, as a product uh, of the world and the discourse uh, that Kevin describes in this book. Uh, and I wish I'd read this book uh, a long time ago. Um, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about that as well. Um, I mean, I was... Um, uh, we, you know, we, we hear, uh, as others have said, about Live Aid and Band Aid um, towards the end of the book. Uh, I was a six-year-old here in, in Dublin uh, at the time, uh, and that, you know, whole uh, kind of series of events, I think, had a big uh, impact on me, uh, as probably it had on a lot of Irish people. Um, but I think a lot of the foundations, uh, Kevin, that you talk about in the book in terms of um, you know how we how we have come to understand uh, NGOs and aid. Um, I, I realize sort of um, that these were the pillars that that I suppose founded my own understanding um, of of the sector and, and the role of aid. Um, and it actually took me decades to even realize the assumptions that I was making and the biases uh, that I uh, had developed. Um, so even just realizing them, not to mention maybe trying to unpick them or trying to reverse them. Um, and it was really only when I when I arrived in India uh, to volunteer uh, for a human rights organization at the age of 22 uh, that people, namely my, my Indian activist colleagues, started challenging these very deeply held assumptions. Uh, so uh, I wish uh, I wish Kevin this book had existed earlier. Um, uh, so that's definitely uh, that's definitely a compliment because I might have moved along that process a bit faster. Um, and, and I suppose uh, coming to the other side of it then, uh, and, and you may or may not be happy to hear this, uh, Kevin, uh, but I can already see a sequel uh, to this book. Um, and I, I think the sequel would look at some of the watershed moments uh, like Goma, for example, um, you know, really rightly causing a lot of soul searching in the sector. Um, it could also look at the, the, the 2014 Band Aid 30. I don't know how many people uh, were very engaged in Band Aid 30, but it was the, um, the, the sequel uh, itself uh, to fundraise for Ebola. Um, and I, at the time, uh, was the Irish ambassador in Sierra Leone. Uh, and I was on the front line of a lot of the criticism locally of Band Aid 30. And I think it was a really interesting Kind of indication of how much has has changed um, in, in terms of of the public response to that, but also the response to that, which I hadn't been privy to in 1984 uh, from an African uh, from an African point of view. Um, but also, you know, maybe a bit of fun as well. I think the sequel to this book could look at things like uh, Radiate. I don't know if everybody's familiar with Radiate, but it's a a way for Africans to send radiators to Norway, um, and, uh, and and you know, funny, but but also very serious. Um, so I, I think you know, Kevin, you very rightly pointed out that the 
in, in my view anyway, the, 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 the Biafra to, to Live Aid um, period, you know, really set those foundations. And I think, you know, it is really interesting to look at uh, to what extent since then, you know, some of these foundations have been um, unpicked or, or not uh, unpicked. Um, and, and I would say that actually, to me, this is one of the really strong elements of the book um, that it shows the durability actually of international NGOs um, and their malleability in different sets of circumstances to retain um, you know, a very prominent position in, in, in the aid uh, world. So, you know, for example, um, you know, we have the, the relief basic needs kind of modes that, that uh, are described in Biafra, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and so on. Um, and then when, when there's a sort of a challenge and, and, and strong Southern organizations come in uh, the picture, um, then international NGOs, you know, switch to a capacity building um, role or, 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 or say they, they are switching to a capacity building uh, role in some cases. Um, and, you know, I think in my own last uh, role in, 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 um, in Africa and South Sudan, uh, up to a couple of years ago, I, I was still observing that most of the finance that was still, you know, coming to, uh, coming from donors it, it may have been reaching Southern NGOs, but actually a lot of it was uh, remaining quite early on in the chain uh, in, in the international NGOs. So, so some things haven't changed, I suppose, as much as, as they would appear to have, um, which I think just sort of speaks to the foundations that, that, that are stressed so strongly um, uh, in this book. Um, I, I think, you know, really glad that Andrew mentioned BRAC. I think BRAC is the most, well, it is literally the most prominent example in, in, in terms of size um, where, where Southern NGOs have, have broken out uh, of, of, that, uh, of that established system. Um, and then another example uh, is, is obviously the human rights side of things um, where, you know, when human rights violations uh, like countries like El Salvador challenged the, the service delivery model, uh, this rights-based approach to development against uh, currency, I in fact, uh, was tasked to write the first paper on this in concern many, uh, many years ago. Um, and, and that brings me to my second favorite quote uh, in the book, uh, which, which I think uh, says a lot, um, where Kevin says, but the mix of idealism, pragmatism, and practicality that shaped this turn to rights-based activism should hardly surprise us. After all, humanitarians are nothing if not adaptable. They share in a sense of urgency that links ethics, morality, and fundraising imperatives to the immediate problem of saving lives. Um, I just think there's so much in those in those few lines, uh, but particularly this point about flexibility and, and durability. Um, you know, having said all that, uh, you know, excellent points as well about Southern agency being exercised in shaping uh, the actions of international NGOs uh, in ways that you know, they, they may or may not uh, realize at the time. And, and again, El Salvador, very, very strong um, examples. Um, and that that's that brings me to my favorite quote from the book, which is the last quote I will I will read. And I didn't have time to type it out, but um, I think it uh, it speaks, uh, you know, it, it, it's a great sort of a summary. Um, and it's, 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 it's citing uh, Stephen L. B. Jensen uh, talking about human rights and it's saying, the NGO sector was not simply a legacy of empire and rearranging colonial patterns to fit a decolonized world. It was also a rejection of imperialism and a product of anti-colonial activism. What we need is a pluralist account that sees a cabinet full of glasses, some half full, some half empty, some drain dry, some fill to the top. For some, the contents have fizzled out and for the others, they are boiling and then there are those glasses smashed uh, beyond repair. So, so I think um, I think this is this is a pluralist account, uh, um, and I and I think um, I think everybody everybody should read it uh, since since this is a book launch. Uh, but I but I really do believe that. And and as you know, somebody who's predominantly a practitioner, uh, I can testify that it's easy to read. Um, you know, not like all academic uh, books, uh, it is it is easy to read. But at the same time, if you are a practitioner. Uh, like me, you will probably uh, do a bit of wincing as well because some stuff is a little bit uh, too familiar. Um, and, and while a lot of things have moved on and, and a huge efforts have been made on, on some of the issues in the book, you know, around aid effectiveness, around localization, and so on, 
Um, I think I think it, it does come across uh, that you know a lot also hasn't changed in terms of some of those fundamental dynamics that were established all the way back in uh, in Biafra. Um, so we so we must learn, uh, and by by we I include donors because uh, we're key supporters of NGOs. So we're we're very much a part of this, um, and this book ends on that point about reflecting uh, and learning in order to change. Um, and I think this book is a great uh, a great vehicle to spur uh, some of those uh, reflect reflection conversations. Uh, so thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Sinead. And um, yes, there's already a promise of a sequel, at least <laughs> from one reader. So that's encouraging. Uh, Kevin, that's an interesting note on which to turn to you for, for your responses. We'll just we'll hold you to the things that came up today rather than future commitments that you may or may not wish to make just now for your next book. But uh, yeah, there's a chance to, to hear from you as the author and to take on board some of the comments you've heard today. Not so much. <laughs> it's very. It's a very strange thing to listen to people talking about a book that you spent almost a decade uh, working on and kind of and, and writing. And uh, I mean, that's my first thing is just to thank the panelists because the way that they uh, read the book and kind of have engaged with it is is really really humbling actually. And and I'm I'm absolutely delighted because these are four people. Obviously, I mean, as you heard, I kind of asked them to contribute because of, because I admire them a lot actually, and I've drawn a lot from from all four. Uh, in different ways of, of, the, of their work and from, from uh, conversations I've had with uh, with Mikhail, with uh, Sylvia and with, with Andrew, and also just from reading uh, from, from reading Sinead's work, even though this is the first time we've actually spoken, I, as, as she said, I took a chance and asked her to, to, to contribute to this because I, I mean, her book on, uh, on Ebola is, is really great. Um, I, I think I, I'll be very brief. I mean, I, actually, before I do that, I just, I also want to kind of acknowledge the fact that this has been hosted by the Mirror Institute and, and I'm really grateful for, uh, the kind of support that Galway has given me um, and, you know, through the Moor and, and through the history department here for the last decade, I've nearly been here now, which uh, is a hell of a long time, actually. Um, and also just in the background, you might notice, but Matthew Garrity is doing all the tech here and, and he's doing a, a sterling job, actually, as well, because he's, it seems to be streaming live on, on every single platform that you can possibly imagine. I don't know how it all works. Um, thanks so much for the comments. I think they're, they're terrific. Um, and I maybe I'll just briefly kind of take uh, some of them because you don't want to listen to me all night uh, kind of responding to, to all of them but I think I think there's lots of stuff there that is kind of uh, I think as Sinead is hinting is is uh, kind of hinting towards some future questions which we probably still need to ask and still need to resolve and which uh, some of uh, some of you in, are, are kind of in, in the audience and on the panel are actually asking and, and are, are you know are, are are pushing forward and um, I see my PhD student Maria Cullen is in the audience as well who's working on a lot of these questions as well between uh, Britain and, and France and, and doing some terrific work in, in that respect. Um, I think Mikhail your, your questions are, are terrific and, and really uh, really challenging and, and uh, I think they're they're kind of really helpful the the I think the two questions which you're mainly kind of asking what is are why not include France uh, is is a really good question. The idea mainly that I had was to try and kind of redirect some of the narrative uh, towards, as as Andrew kind of pointed out, the, the small states alongside the kind of the, the larger post-imperial powers. I felt that lots of other people have actually done some some fantastic work on uh, on MSF and on some frontierism, uh, on témoignage and, and all of those kind of concepts and their interventions. And I didn't really want to run over the, the same ground, but at the same time, I'm really indebted to, to, to you and to people like Eleanor Davy and uh, uh, Mikhail Javoni and de Bertrand Tate and others for, for the work that they've actually done in kind of helping me to frame these questions because I was drawing on, on that kind of tradition all the time. I think what's really interesting is is the question that you're asking about the the, the system actually as well. I mean, it's it's underlying about three different uh, uh, elements of you know. I think you you know this. Sorry, you've asked that this in three of your questions of the four questions that I had kind of taken that you were asking are asking fundamental questions about what kind of a system allows this to emerge, but also the kind of system that they are kind of supporting and kind of contributing to. And that to me was the kind of crux of the question I was trying to get at in, in particularly in the second half of the book or, or the second part of the book where I was kind of thinking about the second and third parts actually really the middle bits where I was trying to kind of tease out some of the ideology that underpins this. And I suppose one of the things that I hope comes from the book is that that kind of symbiosis which you're kind of hinting at I think of between the international organizations states and non-state actors. I mean that, at the, the more I read of this of this material uh, the less convinced I, I was that 
either a bottom up or a top down argument makes sense. It's actually a symbiosis between the two. And particularly the idea, as, as I kind of try and bring it with the, with the basic needs and the new international economic order chapters, that there's often a very strong ideological alignment um, that, allows, uh, that allows these organizations to, to kind of match their agendas. I mean, Matthew Hilton is in the audience here has written very well about the idea of, of non-governmentality and, and Greg Mann as well, who's, who's uh, he's not here, but has written very well in West Africa and the, the same ideas. And I think I've borrowed a lot from, from those ideas that, but what I wanted to do was kind of tease out where and how they got made. And, and that was from that kind of very basic idea of the political formation of some of the individuals within the organizations, but also the kind of the broader context in which they were being um, maybe not dictated to, but certainly kind of channeled in certain directions. And that's particularly visible, I think, once you come to the story of basic needs and international development, where you see that kind of convergence. So I think you're, you're right. I think that that was very much my goal was to try and stretch back that idea of, of a system emerging. And I know we can kind of critique even the idea of the existence of a system, right? And, and whether it actually has a, 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 a crystallized in a form that we can actually call a system. I'm not quite sure. I think this is the moment where it's actually kind of coagulating, if you like, and actually coming into focus, maybe is a better way of putting it. And I suppose that's that's what I was trying to argue in that middle part where you're getting that sense of the NGOs realizing the potential of their role, but also the states realizing. I mean, the my favorite quote I think I, I found in the book was, was from the OECD. I think it's the Swedish delegate in the late 70s who says, how can we tap NGO expertise, and I thought actually that's quite a telling kind of way of putting it. I mean, it's both you can take it both positively, but also kind of how do we actually kind of draw them into the system. Um, Sylvia's comments are, are are terrific again, and I, I mean I I think you know Sylvia's work is going to break uh, re, um, a lot of ground in terms of our kind of refocusing our understanding of humanitarianism in the European context, right? I mean, because you know you're you're now pulling the lens down to the Mediterranean, you know, which obviously has kind of a lot of contemporary resonance for us. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think that the, the point that you make about the, at the end or the challenge or the question that you raised about the kind of historiographical kind of contribution and, and that shift from um, the progression from institutional history to kind of a, a more nuanced thing is, is exactly what I was trying, uh, really trying for. And, I, and I, I hope it works because, I mean, what I was... It the more does, I mean, it does work. <laughs> thanks, Sylvia. But the more I read, you see that this is the problem, probably why it took so long, is because the more I read, the more I realized I needed to kind of have a, a level of analysis, maybe which is up here at the global, but that the units needed to be kind of more um, you know, at both the or at, at the local level in terms of the organizations themselves, at the national level in terms of state governments and aid agencies, but also at the international level. And that was the tricky bit actually was trying to navigate between all of those and and sometimes i think that was you know it it, it meant having to get into those little personal stories but also trying to bring it up to the world bank and to the eu and to the oecd and understanding those dynamics and i, I think that is absolutely i mean what what i think you know if if i if i hope that one thing kind of you know comes from this book that maybe can be used well, to, to other scholars, it is that to, to try and think about that kind of multi scalar approach because it, it kind of avoids, uh, I hope, the kind of the, the, the approach which focuses on the NGOs themselves. Because I, I found the pressures always were, were coming from multiple directions at once and, and were often kind of you know only visible when you looked at them all together. And so, yeah, I, I, if it works, I think that's really good news. <laughs> so, uh, so, thanks very much. Yeah, this is also one of the, obviously the weird things where you, where you wrote the book and finished it. Uh, uh, a good while ago, actually, in the middle of the pandemic. So, um, uh, so this is a, 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 you know different kind of uh, to, to actually reflect on it now again. Um, Andrew's comments are are terrific, you know, and, and and Andrew, I was actually thinking of your comments in the context as well as the project that you're doing with um, with the the leaders from the NGO industry, because I mean, I, I think a lot of the questions you're raising kind of point me back towards localization and some of those issues. I mean, I, I completely agree about BRAC. Um, and I think actually that that is probably where I, I'd, I'd love to see a, a really terrific project, you know, that could emerge from that. I think I would add to BRAC actually some of the Latin American organizations and, and their understanding of compassion. I mean, I had some brilliant reviewers actually to an article I wrote for the Journal of Global History a few years ago, and one of whom pushed me towards looking at a lot of a lot more of the literature on, on Latin America, which I think is very rich and which if we brought it more into that kind of into conversation with those organizations, I think uh, would be um, would be kind of really, really fruitful. And, and we're just kind of, I think what you're hinting at is just 
again, kind of just moving the, the lens a little bit and, and kind of telling the story from a, from a, from a different angle. Um, I, I, I think you're absolutely right about, about Biafra and the media. I think that, that that legacy, I think, is is very visible. And it's, it's really striking, not only in the terms of the types of image, but in I think in, certainly in the recognition that that, as you said, is, is a driver. I think to me in the book, the one case which I kept being drawn back to is Cambodia and how um, deliberate Oxfam's um, use of the media campaign was, no matter when their own, uh, as I mentioned in the book, when their own um, uh, PR or public relations officer was saying, we have to stop this campaign because we can't justify what we're raising money for. You know, they recognize that actually you no know, driving a TV campaign, you know, through Boo Peter in this in this instance and, and through that fundraising is actually going to make us the biggest NGO in, in Britain by a mile and one of the biggest in the world uh, as a consequence. So I think absolutely I, I agree actually with, with the point about um you know more to be said. And I think obviously you've done great work in the ICRC. And I think you know more more as their archives have opened up. I mean, I think that will actually, if you know, it, it will kind of probably stretch out the kind of history that I was trying to write, you know, in, in lots of other directions. And I see actually Boyd van Dyck actually is, is here as well, who's just uh, also written a book on, on international law and international humanitarianism. And I think there's lots of really exciting contributions coming out uh, at, at the same time and on all of these questions. Um, and I think exactly the point that you made, I would agree with about, about Bangladesh. I mean, when, when I started to dig into it, I kind of thought, well, this has been missing. I wonder why it's missing. Maybe it isn't that important. But the more I actually read about it and the more I looked at the archive, the more it really struck me as being significant from all sorts of different angles, which also includes the fact that the Indian government dictated a lot of what was going on, both in India and in Bangladesh. And, and that that, to me, kind of cemented, just to go back to Sylvia's point, the idea that this is also a top-down story, actually, and, and that we're sometimes missing uh, you know, the agency of the southern states, I think, actually needs to be more prominent in our histories in, in, in lots of different ways, like whether it's, you know, whether it's positive or, uh, as in Bayafra, Bangladesh, uh, often quite, quite negative. And, and we, as somebody mentioned to me uh, yesterday, and um, we were chatting about the Canadian context and, you know, that this often prolonged conflicts and, and you know, kind of made things actually much, much worse, the, the collaboration. So I think th these are great points. Um, and maybe I'm clocking a PhD student projects actually for the, for the future here. It's, so if we can get lots of students working on all this stuff. Uh, and finally, I think that the, the major point about the, um, the malleability is, is really fascinating. And, and I, I mean, the reason I, I want to ask you and, and, and Mikhail as well was, um, and I know it's lots of colleagues here, and um, uh, I see uh, Rachel Keller, who I've written with before, um, uh, and Noreen Gumbo uh, is, is here as well. And um, I mean, colleagues from the, the sector have been actually really important in writing this book too, because I've spoken to lots of practitioners in writing this, and it wouldn't be possible without that, because I don't have field experience. So it's only through that kind of, uh, well, there's two elements to it. One is it's through chatting to, to people like yourself that I kind of have gotten a feel for how the, how this has changed and, and where to look actually, even looking backwards where, where you know, where, uh, for example, the questions might be asked of some of the materials that I had when, when through the questions you're asking the present. But also, I mean, I'm very, very keen on, on the idea that we can actually use this as a reflective, um, uh, that we can use these reflective processes to actually think about policies in, in the present. And I mean, you mentioned BRAC as well. And, and I think actually the, the localization question is one which I think kind of is, is an undercurrent in the book. And, and you know, I think will be, you know, is, is obviously quite prominent now. Um, there's also big questions about decolonization, you know, of, of, of an industry as well, which I think are probably in, in uh, Andrew's questions as well. But, um, and I love that Stephen Jensen quote because I love Stephen's book. Uh, and I and I wrote to him after after I'd written uh, something else, um, which which I kind of borrowed some of his ideas from. But I think you're right. I mean, that this it's it, it it really kind of the glass half, uh, or how we fill these glasses is is really a, a useful way of, of of thinking about this. Um, so thanks so much, folks. I hope that wasn't uh, too long. My intervention was definitely longer than yours, but I'm trying to uh, answer all, all the questions. So thanks, Dan. You didn't you didn't oh. stop me from talking. So that's, that seems <laughs> no, to be a good thing. Not at all. No, thank you very much, and uh, that engaging response to the different points that were raised. Um, we have one question that's come up for the Q and A, which I wanted to share and uh, to get your thoughts on. It's from Dominique Clement. Dominique, who visited the Moore Institute, and you'll know Dominique from Alberta. Very nice to. Uh, we rejoined with him uh, virtually. 
So he says, first of all, great book. I especially enjoyed the chapter on the turn to human rights. You, know, you note on page 142, this is terrific, you know. <laughs> We're getting down to specifics. How most major NGOs in Central America had linked relief to protection of rights. But you note only in passing the exception of concern and save the children. And again, briefly on P149, P how the latter stretched humanitarianism rather than rights. Can you elaborate on why NGOs would re reject rights talk? One of the key arguments in this book is that humanitarian NGOs strategically used rights talks uh, to frame their work beginning in the 1970s. It seems to me that it is important uh, to this argument to explain why some explicitly rejected rights talk. We know, for example, that a rejection of rights-based activism was not unusual amongst many social justice movements, notably, notably feminist organizations, because they perceived rights activism as political, legalistic, and or reformist rather than transformative. Was that the case with humanitarian NGOs? Challenging question. So your, your, your thoughts. Yeah, and, and it's maybe more challenging by the fact that Dominique has written a book about human rights in Canada. So uh, <laughs> which is a really useful book when I was uh, when I was when I was writing uh, that chapter. Um, I think it's it's a really good question, actually, Dominique. And uh, thanks for 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 coming. Uh, I think the the key thing to me, actually, you mentioned Save the Children and Concern and, and those kind of more operational, more um, emergency relief focused organizations. I think the, the key thing there is, is that human rights is seen as political. Um, and even within Oxfam, it's it's very kind of um, wrapped up in, in the Cold War, actually, and, and it creates a lot of tension over to what extent you can actually talk about human rights because you're in inherently critiquing the United States, actually, and, and you're inherently critiquing certain types of intervention. And I think that's why they were extremely careful in this period about how they actually framed it. Now, um, they became more comfortable with it as, as time went by, and particularly in the 1990s. Um, I think in this moment, it's much more the kind of the left-leaning groups that are more comfortable with it because they are striving for something akin to solidarity with, the, with those uh, groupings. But it is very much framed as, a, as, a, as an anti-American anti thing by opponents of, of those organizations. And so... I think they're not willing really to risk, in, in Oxfam's case, they're just not willing to risk the, the, the loss of support. Um, so I think that, in a, in a nutshell, is, is probably the most prominent reason why they don't want to engage with it. It's not necessarily that they don't believe that, or that they can't see the human rights abuses because they very much are, are watching them on the ground and then seeing the people come in, but that they're just trying to sidestep that, that kind of confrontation, actually. Yeah, I wonder, we're, 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 we're coming a little bit towards the end of our, our available time. Um, I wondered if I could could ask you a little bit about your your terminal point of Live Aid and the, the rationale for that. So that's 1985. Um, it's tempting to think of it in you know the, the terms that you know forgive me Schiller makes available between the naive and sentimental. So the naive, you you you, you have the experience that you have like in childhood. The sentimental is the reimagining of that experience, but you can't go back to the sensibility that obtained at that moment of childhood. To take one example, so. I mean, is that partly the, the the perspective that you're taking on Live Aid, or just if you'd say something a little bit more about that 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 arc uh, and, and ending at that point? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, it's a really good question, Dan. I mean, the the re there's two reasons why I kind of fin finished on that point. One is, and this kind of is kind of what you're you're it kind of goes to what you're just mentioning, but it's I framed it as kind of populist because that's what Bob Geldof actually framed it as, and and the the reason that's so significant is because it was a challenge actually to the existing NGO system because it came from outside. The majority of the, of the response comes from outside that. And actually, I mean, I know populism has been used in lots of different ways over the last few years, but for me, it was the best way of articulating a movement which was actually anti-bureaucracy, explicitly, you know, anti-bureaucracy, anti-kind of uh, administrative costs, for example, which they kept kind of going on about, and which was also in contrast to the NGOs themselves was cross class actually. And, and I mean, I, in the chapter, I talk a lot about how, you know, drawing on lots of really, really good work because there's been lots of excellent stuff on, on Ethiopia and that period. But I mean, it's very much a kind of a case where you get this sense that, you know, the, the rich person can make the same kind of sacrifice uh, as, as the poorest person. So in the case of Canada, I have a, a case where you know, um, a businessman sells his entire ranch and gives the money to, uh, to uh, 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 well, it's Northern Lights in Canada, um, the equipment um, which feeds into Band-Aid. But you also have um, First Peoples in Northern Canada 
you know, making sacrifices, which it's it's the kind of that idea that it's much broader than a movement which had emerged from the NGOs in the late 60s, mainly through students or through kind of left-leaning Christians, which is much more a middle-class movement. And the reason I end then on that is that that challenge forces the NGOs themselves to think anew about what they're doing. And to go back to one of the uh, questions that was raised by the panelists, I mean, the, it often leads them to um, not very pleasant conclusions, which is that you make a lot of money by using certain types of images. Um, it also actually, the, the other thing it highlights is they're just, that they have just completely ignored young people, um, particularly you know, their, their form of consum consumerism and consumption as a, as a model of activism. And just I miss that totally and utterly. I have no idea how to deal with it. And it forces them to then rethink what they're doing and leads kind of maybe towards, you know, to, to go back to Andrew's question, you know, leads towards them adopting more explicitly certain types of images and certain types of forms of campaigning, right the way up to, to Band Aid 30, I suppose, in, in 2015 as or, or 2014, as um as Sinead was pointing out. So it is a critical moment and, and that tension between you know, that kind of naivety and then the the kind of more um, knowing organizational um, uh, model that the NGOs have actually comes out in, in kind of all sorts of different ways, but actually leads the NGOs to, to move much more towards kind of trying to capture some of that, some of that kind of spirit. Um, and they also make lots of money from it. So that kind of helps them because they're, they recognize a revenue stream there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's really probably a good note on which to, to end. I mean, there's, there's so much in this book um, it is a cultural history. It's, in effect, a kind of economic history in some respects. It's obviously a political one. Um, <clears throat> it tells us about so many different modalities of, of participation in a global history uh, at the same time. Uh, but just one other comment. I mean, I've had a chance to start reading it, and it's also delightfully written. And um, really congratulate you and, and thank you for for an exercise in, in style in the best sense. And, the, you know, Sinead was commenting on it, a book that actually can be read. And I think, I, I, I hope, and you, you deserve a wide audience for this, for, for so many reasons, both as a work of history, as a contribution, as something that raises our understanding of, of transformative moments uh, in the world of, of the last really 50 years and, and more. So thank you very much. I want to thank our participants again today to, to Andrew, to Mikhail, Sylvia, and Sinead. Uh, it's been a terrific session. Thank you for your time and a chance to really convene as a group and to think about the opportunities for research in this, this important area. So thank you all very much and to our audience for joining us today. <laughs>